Good morning and welcome to this service of worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. On this day, which is holy unto the Lord, we gather not alone, but as Christ's body. As ones who would suffer and rejoice together, we gather. On this day of wonder and hope, we gather not in isolation, but in community, we gather. As those who would love and care for one another, we gather. On this day of prayer and praise, of silence and song, we gather. Welcome again to this joint virtual service of Christ Presbyterian Church of Morovia and Church Street, Common Presbyterian Church in America. We're so glad that you have joined us again on this Sunday morning, as you do each Sunday. And we ask you to invite others to join us as we continue in this service. Just one announcement. If you're 75 years of age or older and you're interested in receiving the vaccine for COVID-19, uh, we have emailed out the form that you need to uh, complete to get on the waiting list or uh, there is also a link on that form that you can click and go to the place and reserve your space. So we're glad that uh, some of us are, have already started to get the uh, vaccine and uh, that they're doing well and that is certainly an encouragement and builds confidence for all the rest of us to go ahead and do it as well. We continue to pray for all of our church members, uh, both churches, Christ Church and Church Street, our family members, our friends. Uh, we pray for this local and national, international community that are still battling with this COVID-19 disease. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are hospitalized or have been diagnosed and is at home and right now battling this disease. And of course, we pray for all the many families whose lives have been touched uh, because of the loss of their loved ones. We pray for and give praise for our newly inaugurated president and vice president of these United States. And we pray God's blessings upon them, uh, their, that God would give them favor in their works and as they continue to do that which they have been elected to do. Here this morning, uh, the Old Testament scripture coming from Psalm 62, verse 1 through 12. Truly my soul rest, finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times. You people, pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. 
Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, O God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love, and you reward everyone according to what they have done. Psalm 62. From the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 7, 29 through 31. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it is not theirs to keep, those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 through 31. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Let me also remind us, our church family, that the homegoing service, celebration of life service for Deacon Roy Williamson will be held this Tuesday at 11 o'clock at Valhalla. Uh, we invite you that feel comfortable and those who can to come and share and, uh, and with the family, but please pray for them uh, as you go along. Uh, after I present our preacher for the day, uh, then the choir, gospel ensemble will come and bless us with music. I believe it's been since the early 2000s that Church Street and Christ Church began a, an annual January pulpit exchange. The pastor of Christ Church has preached here for our services, and I would preach there for their Sunday morning service. And then we added, on top of the worship to that day of getting together, we added a meal, a fellowship meal. And of course, we can't ever just get together without having a time around the table where we can talk and laugh. And we spent many hours together over these years in worshiping, but also in eating together around the table where we have gotten to know each other much, much better. And we thank God for not only the worship and the eating, but we have also been involved in outreach ministry to this community together. Members of our two congregations have worked side by side in the community for some special outreach mission service projects, and for that we celebrate. And so we have developed relationships. We care for one another. We pray for one another. We support each other in many of the various activities that each congregation has. And so we welcome back to the pulpit this morning the Reverend Cordelia Howard Diamond, the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church. As I saw on their website, it says they are located at the busy intersections of Jeff Road and Douglas Road in Monrovia, right here in Huntsville, Alabama. Pastor Cordelia has been at the church since May of 2013. She is our friend, our sister, uh, our, and our preacher for today. So we pray that you will pray for her and with her. And even though you, many of you are not here today, you can say amen and not know she'll feel it across the airways from where you are. We, let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we honor you today for your love and grace and mercy we honor you because you are the God of all gods. You are our Lord. You are our Redeemer. You are the one who has loved us, even though sometimes we acted unloving, even toward one another. We thank you, God, for gathering us together on this day in this way. And we pray that you bless all that is said and done in this place, oh God, that it may be to your glory. Bless the preacher, bless the choir and the musicians, the director. Bless those, oh God, who will be participating in this service, leading us, oh God, to your throne where we can pray and praise and give you worship. This we ask today in Jesus' name, amen.
Lord of all. Lord of all and ruler of nations. Sing, you are God. You are God of all the earth. So let all of your people praise let you. Let all of your people praise you. And sing of your marvelous work. And sing of your marvelous work. Sing every knee. Every knee shall bow before you. And every tongue will confess. And every tongue will confess. That you are Lord. That you are Lord. People praise Let all you. of your people praise you and sing of your marvelous work. Sing of your marvelous work. Every knee, every knee shall bow before you, and every tongue will confess. And every tongue will confess that you are Lord. That you are Lord. Your Lord of all. You are our Lord. You are my God and my King. And there's no one greater. There's no one greater. For you are Lord. For you are Lord. The Lord of all. Sing, yes, you are Lord. Yes, you are Lord. Glory, I will praise you because you are my God, you are my God and my King, and there's no one greater. There's no one greater for you are Lord. For you are Lord. a Lord that is over all, a Lord that's over today, all yesterday, right. over this year and last all year, right, over your finances, over your health, over your deliverance and your salvation. Why don't you just get up wherever you are, stand on your feet in your living room or in this place and sing, we worship you, oh God. We worship you. We worship you. All glory is yours. All glory is yours. You are the Lord. You are the Lord. The Lord of all. The Lord of all. We worship you. We worship you. Our glory is yours. Our glory is yours. You are the Lord. You are the Lord. The Lord of all. The Lord of all. We worship you. We worship you. Our glory is yours. Our glory is yours. And you are the Lord. You are the Lord. The Lord of all. The Lord of all. We worship you. We worship you. Our glory is yours. Our glory is yours. And you are the Lord. You are the Lord. The Lord of all. All glory is yours. Sing, you are the Lord. You are the Lord. The Lord of all. We worship you. All glory is yours. Sing, you are the Lord. You are the Lord. The Lord of all. 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 Oh, <laughs> 
from a mighty long way you all weren't listening we had a, a word lord of all you've been good to me god has been so good even in the midst of darkness of isolation of loss and of pain god's goodness is not overcome it is not overshadowed it is all in all and we praise you lord this day in this place in truth and in spirit, wherever we are gathered, we are gathered in Christ. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to begin by saying a word of gratitude to Church Street, to the elders, to the deacons, to Pastor Mitchell for allowing me this opportunity to share God's word from this holy space this morning. Um, this is one of the greatest honors that I have every year um, and have had for the past seven years to come and share God's word with my brothers and sisters at Church Street. And this year it's even more special because it's both of our churches together. <laughs> We're not in two different spaces worshiping. We are united in spirit and truth together. And that gives me chills. <laughs> so I am grateful to God for that opportunity, which wouldn't have happened without this pandemic. Let's just be real. God is good and faithful all the time. Well, let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll dig into the scripture together. Lord of all, mm -hmm. you are so good. Yes, Lord. And we acknowledge that. We worship you. We offer our prayers of petition and thanksgiving before your holy throne, knowing that you hear us, that you seek relationship with us, mm -hmm. even when we're scared to seek relationship with one another. God, during these holy moments, while we stand before you, open us completely to you, to your word, to your love, to your Holy Spirit. Speak, Lord. 
Give us ears that hear, hearts that understand, hands and feet that rise to the challenge. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I'm going to be using two scriptures in the sermon today. Um, One, I'm just going to kind of summarize for us. But one, I'm going to start out reading to us. It's uh, from Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went on a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I have a confession. One of my favorite movies of all time as an adolescent, I mean, I still kind of like it now, but as an adolescent, it was the top, was the movie The Dead Poets Society. Have any of y'all ever seen that? It was set in 1959 at the fictional, elite, conservative, Vermont, all-boys boarding school, Welton Academy. And it tells the story of an English teacher who inspires his students through the teaching of poetry. Now, at 15, this movie was everything. But watching it again as an adult, there are some serious problematic issues with that movie not the least of which is a lack of representation of people of color and of women looking at this elite boarding school phenomenon as if it was the end-all, be-all. But there were some really good moments for this 1989 moment movie. And there's this one moment in particular that has stuck in my head this week as I've read these scriptures. You see, they're in the middle of a school assembly, All the boys gathered in a church. The headmaster is standing in front of them, giving them a strict lecture on the rules and regulations that they must abide by as students of this Welton Academy. And suddenly, a phone rings. Now remember, this is set in 1959. Telephones didn't yet have push buttons. They were certainly not mobile devices. And there comes Charlie Dalton, the classic screw-up. And he stands up holding this phone and answers it boldly and addresses the entire student body and faculty. He answers it and says, hello, Welton Academy. Why, yes, the headmaster is in. Just a moment. Mr. Nolan, it's for you. It's God. He says we should have girls at Welton. The absurdity of that moment, the instant that Charlie stands up and challenges the status quo and faces severe repercussions. The conversation is comedic and even absurd. God isn't going to call us up on a cell phone and press us into service. But I've got to tell you, after stories of the calling of the disciple as a child, I kind of expected the call from God to look exactly like that. A phone call, a telegram, something saying, hey, by the way, calling you. Come on. 
I mean, just look at the disciples this morning. Jesus is standing on the shore and he yells out, hey, follow me, all of you, and I'll make you fish for people. And Mark tells us immediately, not seconds hesitation, they left their nets, their means of providing for themselves and followed him. And it didn't just happen once. Just a few minutes later, he sees James and John with their dad, and he says, hey, you, follow me. And immediately, they leave their father in the boat with the hired people and follow him. Mm -hmm. Immediately. All over scripture, people are getting up and going when God calls. Abraham and Sarah move out on a promise and a prayer. Moses heads for Egypt with nothing but a shepherd's crook and his brother Aaron to write his sermons. Elijah stands defiant facing 450 prophets of Baal. And here in the New Testament, fishermen dropping their nets, tax collectors forgetting about credits and debits, People just leaving their parents behind? As a child, these moments were moments when people had direct lines to God, where God might as well have issued a telegram, wrote out marching orders, or gave them a ring on their phones telling them exactly what to do and where to be and how to do it, and they dutifully obeyed. And they're held up as great examples, which of course they are. But over the years, there's been something in the back of my mind, whispering, wondering. But what if I don't like fish or people? What if I don't like fish or people, God? I'm not a fisherwoman. (laughs) Um, I don't do worms on hooks or otherwise. Um, I'm not squeamish. In junior high, we did all sorts of dissections, and I love dissecting the frog and the fetal pig and the shark and the sheep's eye. Like, that was my jam. But we got to the earthworm. I was out. None of that. Um, I also don't take fish off hooks, because that's gross. Um, Hooks, in general, freak me out. (laughs) Just not a pleasant sight. Um, And there are times more times when I care to admit that um, I don't like people that much either. I'm an introvert. Um, And people can be petty and angry and fake and downright mean. So this whole idea of fishing for people, Mm -hmm. well, it sometimes puts me in the mind of the ones I want to throw back until they grow up a little bit. And I'll admit that's caused some tension in the 22 years that I've served the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, 15 as an ordained pastor. This whole not liking fish or people thing comes up at the worst possible moments. And I wonder exactly what I think I'm playing at when the urge to throw one back or to pack up the rod and reel kicks in. But as I was reading over our lessons from the lectionary today, and I looked past the Mark passage, past his swiftness, his immediacy, and I saw that it's paired up with another scripture passage of someone whom I relate with far more often than I care to admit. Someone who didn't like fish or people. Someone who didn't jump on God's call. Anybody got a guess of who I might be thinking of here? Jonah. Jonah was reluctant, Mm -hmm. withdrawn, stubborn. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah chapter 3 says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim it, the message that I give to you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city and he cried out, 
40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on their sackcloth. And then in verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. That was the second time God spoke to Jonah. But let's go back to that first time when he says, Jonah, go to Nineveh, that desert city. Go, share my word. And Jonah? Well, Jonah stands on the dock with tickets for Tarshish, the whole other end of the world. Why was Jonah not willing to go when God said go? Was it because he was tired? Was it because it was too far? Was it because he was having camel issues? No, no. Jonah's problem was with Nineveh, a city on the east bank of the Tigris River in Assyria. Mm -hmm. Those Assyrians, well, they weren't very popular in Israel. They plundered Palestine, looting and burning its cities, deporting its inhabitants. In 722 and 721 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel had passed out of existence as a result of Assyrian conquest. To Jonah, Nineveh was the object of intense hostility and anger. Go to Nineveh, God says, Mm -hmm. and warn them that because of the sins of the people, the city's doomed to destruction. Mm -hmm. Jonah responds by saying, anywhere, Lord, anywhere but Nineveh. He might as well have said, but what if I don't like fish or people? And instead of going to the desert town of Nineveh, he buys a ticket and boards a boat to a city at the other end of the known world. Mm -hmm. But my friends, it is not so easy to evade the divine call. And here we have a supernatural storm arise. The ship begins to sink and the mariners cast lots to see who's to blame for the danger that's befallen them. And the blame of the storm is immediately put upon this mysterious stranger, Jonah. And he says, cast me into the sea. And sadly, they do. And the storm calms, and Jonah is swallowed by a giant fish. What? The storm's supposed to be over, right? It even says the storm storm stops. And in our minds, that goes, ah. But in Jonah's life, that went, ah, big fish. (laughs) And he gets swallowed and lives in the belly of the big fish. We call a whale, but scripture says big fish. And he turns to the only thing he has, prayer. He turns to God and says, I'm sorry, Mm -hmm. I messed up. I messed up. And God, God gives him three days to dry out a little bit in that fish to figure out where he's messed up, and then causes the fish to spit him out on dry land. And that's when we get that second call, go to Nineveh. This time Jonah does as he's told. He goes to Nineveh and utters the dire prediction of impending destruction. He preaches fire and brimstone like nobody's business. And to his great dismay, the king, to the humblest of servants, they all repent. And worse, God forgives them. And when God forgives the Ninevites, Jonah begins to feel very sorry for himself as he thinks that God's made him out to be a fool and a liar. And when a little weed that's grown up over him to provide shade from the hot sun withers by a worm, Jonah becomes so angry that he wishes he were dead. 
He still doesn't like fish or people. And that's how the story ends. He doesn't learn anything. He's sitting there, still not liking fish or people. That story teaches us so much. For contained within just those few four short chapters are themes that we wrestle with every single day. Compassion, God's love, and forgiveness. Jonah has a complete lack of compassion. He doesn't love his neighbors, the Ninevites. In his mind, they're just heathens who deserve the very worst God can throw at them. He doesn't care if they repent. In fact, he doesn't want them to repent. He doesn't want them even close to the God he worships. He wants them to get what they deserve. He wants his kind of justice. But what we learn is that God's love is for everyone. Jew, Gentile, and even the Ninevite. Mm -hmm. I'll admit compassion is something that I've wrestled with a lot. I want people to have compassion on me. And I'll even have compassion on people I'm close to. Mm -hmm. But it's those people out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, in theory, sure. But in practice, the Ninevites were like Jonah's enemies. And it's difficult to think that God would dare to show others mercy, grace, and forgiveness. But he does. And so should we. Compassion is something we're given and something we must return But there's a difficulty here when you add the truth of God's love into the mix. Because God's love is not dependent on any human understanding of justice. One of the most wonderful aspects of our faith is that we know, no matter what, we have only to ask God and we will be forgiven. But I have to ask, where's the justice in that plan? It's absent. For forgiveness isn't a matter of justice. Forgiveness from God is not deserved. It's an act of grace, of love, that overlooks our wrongs in order to bring us back to what is right. And in its way, that kind of love goes against our rational ideas of right and wrong. Barbara Brown Taylor, in her book, The Gospel Medicine, writes... In case you haven't noticed, Christianity is a religion in which sinners have all the advantages. They can step on your feet 50 times, and you're supposed to keep on smiling. They can talk bad about you every time you leave the room, and it's your job to excuse them with no thought of getting even. The burden's on you, because you've been forgiven yourself. And God expects you to do unto others as God has done unto you. God's love isn't only for good people, but for all people. God's love isn't only for good people, but for all people. God doesn't offer special treatment to people who sin a little or to people who sin a lot. God simply loves all of us all of the time. And the harder part to hear is that we're supposed to love others the way that God loves us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God's love for us is never in question. God's desire to forgive us and help us to be better the next time is never in question. Mm -hmm. The only question is what will we do with the freedom God gives us when it comes to accepting that love and forgiveness? Again, I turn to Barbara Brown Taylor here. She captures this challenge for me. She says, if God's willing to stay with me in spite of my meanness, my weakness, my stubborn self-righteousness, then who am I to hold these things against someone else? Better I should confess my own sins 
then keep track of yours. Only it is hard to stay focused on my shortcomings. I'd rather stay focused on yours, especially when they were hurtful to me. Staying angry at you is how I protect myself from you. Refusing to forgive you is not only how I punish you, but it's also how I keep you from getting close enough to hurt me again. And nine times out of ten, it works. Only there's a serious side effect. It's called bitterness. And it can do terrible things to the human body and soul. And we see that bitterness in Jonah, who would rather die than live in a world where Ninevites are forgiven. He would rather die than see them forgiven. Mm -hmm. He feels more love and concern for a weed than he does for the tens of thousands of people God just redeemed. Jonah's bitterness is almost as absurd as his journey in the belly of the great fish. And yet, in my own life, I've seen people cling to bitterness, Mm -hmm. to hatred, to the wrongs of others, because their unconscious minds know that forgiveness might just confuse the issue. Mm -hmm. They might be okay with fish, but they really don't like people. There's this plaque on the wall of a building in Amsterdam, and on it says that this little house was once the house of Cory Ten Boom. Now, for those of you who don't know who she is, Cory and her family had hidden Jews in their home before they were found out by the Nazis and were themselves taken away to a concentration camp. Cory's father died soon after entering the camp, and her sister succumbed to pneumonia while they were there. Corey was the only one in her whole family to live throughout the entire experience. But after the war, she took it upon herself to write and to speak about her experience. And one of her oft-spoken topics was forgiveness. And one day, so the story goes, she came face to face with the cruelest guard she had known at the camps, a man who had tormented her, who had humiliated and degraded her and her sister. And he stood across from her and reached out his hand and said, will you forgive me? And this is what she writes. She says, I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But I know that the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. I prayed, Jesus, help me. Woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one that was stretched out to me, and I experienced an incredible thing. She says, the current started in my shoulder and raced down into my arms and sprang into our clutched hands. And then this warm reconciliation seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. She cried with her whole heart. She said, for a long moment we grasped hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I've never known the love of God so intensely as I did at that moment. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover all along that that prisoner was you. But one thing that's important to note This forgiveness, this didn't happen the day after she was released, the week after, even the year after. This was forgiveness years in the making, in Corey's life and in the guard's life. He apologized, and he took serious, seriously what he had done. This took some real soul work on his part to be able to do that. This is not like forgiving an abuser while his knee is still on your neck. Forgiveness requires work to be done within you. And in the case of an abuser, 
within them as well. This is not something that just happened out of the goodness of Corey's heart. This was God working away, chiseling away, moment after moment, day after day, in her life and in the guard's life, to execute a real change. I was reminded of what happens when you can bring yourself, maybe not to like fish, but definitely to like people. (laughs) This week, when I heard the words of Amanda Gorman and her work, The Hill We Climb, that she presented during the inauguration, two sections really stood out to me, but this one broke me. We close the divide because we know To put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek to harm none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together, victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. These convicting words from a 22-year-old poet brought tears to my eyes and recognition to my soul. Do I want to be one of those that let bitterness burn in me so much that like Jonah, despite seeing the works of God in the world, I sit under a weed and curse while God's people flourish? Or do I want to respond with a yes to God's call, with forgiveness and love in my heart and in my soul? Jonah provides a mirror for us to examine ourselves, a painfully clear reflection of our lives. The reluctant prophet reminds us that hate also takes shape in souls that should be focused on the growth of the kingdom. Souls like mine, souls like yours. The people of Nineveh didn't deserve to be forgiven. Jonah knew that, but God forgave them anyway. And you know what? When you get right down to it, we don't deserve to be forgiven, but God forgives us anyway. Compassion, God's love for all, and forgiveness. They make Jonah's story more than just a fish tale. May we leave here this morning first as forgiven people, able to forgive as compassionate people, able to show compassion to all, realizing that God loves each of us. And closing with the end of that prophetic poem, but one thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and changes our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with. Every breath from my bronze-pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind-swept northeast, where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake grim cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade aflame and unafraid, the new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only 
who are brave enough to be it. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, we are so grateful for your compassion, for your mercy, for your strength, for your love. Lord, right now, enter into every heart. Right now, Lord, if there are brothers and sisters who have not yet known you, who have not yet confessed that you are Lord of all, God, convict their hearts and their spirits this time. May they pray, Lord, along with me. Father God, we thank you for Jesus, who entered into our hearts and into our world to save us. I accept him right this second as my Lord and my Savior. God, may I have compassion like Christ does. And may I love as you love. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So um, this morning, we have affirmed that God is Lord of all, and then we acknowledged that he's been good to us, and the word that was delivered that we need to forgive, and we need to love like God loves, and we need to have compassion. And with all of that, we now need to celebrate that we made it out. So those of you at home, in your PJs, maybe in your house coat, please stand up. Don't be worried if somebody looking at you. Please stand up, join with us, and celebrate that we made it. I made it out all right. I made it out all right. I made it. I made it out. I made it out all right. I made it out all right. I made it out. I made it out all right. I made it out all right. I made it out. I made it out all right. I made it out all right. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't leave me no forsake. You didn't leave me no forsake. Thank you. Thank you. My enemies, take me. my enemies take me. I feel I'm still in the fire. I made it, I made it out alright. I made it. I made it out. I made it out alright. I made it out. I made it.
I made it out all right. I made it out all right. I made it. I made it out all right. I made it out all right. I made it. I made it out all right. I made it out all right. I made it. Anybody here made it? I made it. Can you raise your hand? I made it. I made it out. I made it. I made it out. Thank God for the message. Thank God for Amen. our messenger. Let's put our hands together and give God praise for Amen. Pastor Cordelia. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you for that, that word today. Amen. We praise God for our relationship and our friendship between not only us, but between our churches. And uh, we look forward to what God has in store for us in the time to come. Thank you, choir. As always, uh, musicians, director, thank you for what you have blessed us with this morning in music. And thank our AB team for what you have always uh, continued to do since March of last year. And so we praise God today. I mean, uh, we choir's going to take us out after Pastor Cordelia come and give us any final words and benediction but please do remember uh, church street to pray for the williamson family as they go through this time of bereavement just let us go go with joy of the holy spirit Amen. go go in the peace of christ which passes all understanding and go Go with the love of God who first loved us Amen. and share that love with everyone we meet. Amen. 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 I made it. I made it out all right. I made it out all right. I made it. I made it out all right. I made it out all right. Twitter!